Hello, everyone, and welcome to Farming Matters. I'm your host, Erin Schneider. I work with the SARE program, and I also farm in Wisconsin. And I'm here today with our producer and co-host, Marie Flanagan. Hey, Marie. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and um, I'm also here with our very special farmer guest and beekeeper, Justina Block. Justina is with Osmia Bees in Ohio. And as you know, our Farming Matters show helps really gives our grantees a chance to share what they did, what worked, what they learned, and just to really just have a conversation about, about their project. And in this case, we get to learn all about what it means to be a bee. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited. My name is Justina Block. I'm owner and founder of Osmia Bee Company. I've been raising um, solitary bees since 2010. And around 2016, 17, I approached several uh, organizations here in Cincinnati, uh, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden, Green Acres Foundation, Bernheim um, Forest. It's the largest arboretum in the U.S. and um, Spring Grove Arboretum. And I, not all, they all had honeybee programs, but no one heard of native bees or solitary bees. And they're like, what are they? <laughs> And I'm like, well, this is why I'm here to help you. And um, at the time, I just wanted to donate my bees, my habitats, if they would create an education program. Um, and they all agreed. But at the Cincinnati Zoo, within seven weeks, they said, we're getting quite a few phone calls about what you're doing. Can we sell these in our gift shop? And I said, really? And the rest was history. Um, <laughs> I... Uh, started to produce them with the help of friends that are in business and built a business um, plan and just started locally, very organically. Um, and it's been amazing. I started to reach out to other researchers um, uh, like the um, USDA Bee Lab in Logan, Utah. And they really have become not only my mentors, but great friends. And they've been so supportive. So uh because of them, this is what, um, you know, I learned about not only about the mason bee, but using the mason bee in crop pollination, such as almonds is one of the biggest ones. You probably know that. They're also used for pollen pollination services in um, tart cherry, apples, and pears. And potentially, uh, they can be held back a little longer for blueberries and strawberries. They've done some research on that. So I'd love hearing that flight path like you know that the bees have you know that curiosity and people it just kind of that convergence and now it's coming back home to Cincinnati and has led, led you to um, your Sarah Grant project do you have some just want to like take us through like kind of the nuts and bolts of what what you unearthed and discovered along the way with with your project I think you had some great visuals of like your hedgerows and alley crops that you're mentioning and um so Blooms for Mason Bees was the title of our uh, research project, developing a regional seed, de, I'm sorry, Blooms for Mason Bees, developing a regional, uh, oh my gosh, find your center. Blooms for Mason Bees, developing a regional spring flowering seed mix to support and conserve North Central Mason Bees. I'd like to thank all our collaborators who without this research would not be possible. So thank you to the USDA and SARE and University of Minnesota um, for funding this research project. You know, the Cincinnati Zoo, Penn State University, Ohio Prairie Nursery, OPN, Ohio State University, and Green Acres. So a great appreciation for all of them participating in this research project. So what are mason bees? I get that question all the time. Well, mason bees are cavity nesting and solitary. In other words, they do not live in a colony like honeybees and bumblebees. Fun fact, honeybees and bumblebees uh, represent a half a percent of all bee spe species on the planet. So they are a very small portion of the bees um, here, you know, that represent for pollination services. Mason bees, there's over 400 species worldwide. We have 140 species here in North America. The native blue orchard bee, Osmia lignaria, is an important pollinator for valuable spring blooming crops. This has been a proven pollinator, like I said, out in California, Washington, Utah, and Oregon. 
and different um, crops such as almond, tart cherry, apple, and pears. And you can actually hold them back a little longer for um, blueberry and strawberries. They've been working in blueberry, strawberries, and raspberries. So it's a, a very important pollinator. Um, solitary, what does that mean? Solitary bees, um, the females are all queens. Once they emerge, they have a year life cycle, right? So once they emerge, they're actually at the end of their life cycle, the last six to seven weeks. She will mate. She'll start foraging, collecting, um, uh, collecting uh, pollen and nectar. She will find, a, she's cavity nesting, but here we provide them with reeds for cavity nesting. She will collect enough pollen and nectar. She'll lay an egg. Then she starts to collect, um, collect mud or some kind of soil compound and she'll build a wall. And she, as you can see down at the bottom of the screen, that's what a uh, nest looks like. So she'll collect pollen and nectar, pollen and nectar, lay an egg, build a mud wall, and can, and make these little chambers of um, where she will lay the pollen and the egg. And then that egg will hatch. The larvae will consume the pollen provisions. It will spin a cocoon and develop into a full-size bee within eight weeks. So there is a full-size bee, not a baby bee. I hear a lot of speakers say it's a really cute baby bee but it's really an adult bee and it winters over it hibernates over the winter as an adult bee so during this process um you know the bees you know once they're finished with their uh six to seven week life cycle they're you know have pollinated an entire orchard um and they're the first bees to emerge. They, they will start pollinating in cooler weather, like 55 degrees. The honeybees may send scouts out at 55 degrees, but they really don't start working till 60 and above. So the mason bee is a very important pollinator for these orchards. So what are we doing? The question is, um, which herbaceous plants do mason bees visit in Ohio? So with this, um, we employed uh, 30 different nest boxes. And I'd like to thank Dr. Natalie Boyle from Penn State University. She created this uh, nest box that we um, put together for our project. It was easy to install, it was easy to ship, and um, it just had the right amount of reeds for the bees to nest. Our goal is design a seed mix to support springtime pollinators, particularly the blue orchard bee, Osmia lignaria, or Bob, as a foundation for sustainable mason bee production. And we'll talk about that later about our enclosure propagation. So we actually place our bees inside a release tube. It's about six inches long and it's capped on both sides. That's where we place the bees in a release tube. Out in orchards, we would probably use a PVC pipe. So we'd use a PVC pipe with, we drill a hole at the end, we cap it. So when we, because we, we're going to release like a thousand bees. So we would need a bigger um, release tube. That's what we use in the orchards. But in this case, in my kits, we take a six inch tube, we place the bees, it's a release tube inside, remove the cap and then the bees start to emerge. Inside that, um, you know, is the, the reeds. We don't use paper reeds, uh, bamboo. We use Phragmites, it's a grass. It's harvested in the wetlands, dried out. Um, we use six inches, um, a six inch reed, and the depth in this is seven inches to give the bees some protection from wind and rain in the weather when they land. So here, why are we doing this? The blue orchard bee is native and an economically important alternative pollinator for some of the highest valued crops in the United States, which mentioned is, you know, almonds with, um, you know, uh, Stuart Resnick um, Wonderful Orchards is the largest almond producer in the world in California with 1.6 million acres of almonds. It's a lot of almonds. So with all the fruit crops they have out there and almonds, this would be a great bee to, to and you know, put in their orchards, which they already are doing. 
Currently, there's no seed mix. Um, there's no springtime seed mix has been developed for Midwest pollinators. Our project changes that. Um, California, the USDA B Lab in Logan, Utah, already developed a uh, floral seed mix that some of the orchards are already using as floral strips and hedgerows, which is very helpful um, to, because once um, almond bloom or cherry bloom is over, the bees have a short distance. Mason bees only fly around um, 300 feet. They've been known maybe to go a mile. So you need additional floral resources after um, orchard bloom so they continue to propagate. So it's important to have those floral strips. Here are some of our volunteers um, at the Cincinnati Zoo, at Green Acres. Of course, Jamie Strange and his grad students were amazing. Um, we were making an education video. I, I don't know if you've seen that or not in an uh, orchard I've been working with for the last four years here in Cincinnati. She has a variety of 60 different um, apples, tart cherry, peaches, and plums. And so she's decided the last three years not even to use honeybees. She's just using the bobs to um, pollinate her orchard, and she's very happy about that. Um, the far far right corner, um, that is a backyard gardener. And here's some of the other, um, other pictures that show you what our volunteers are doing um, here um, across Ohio. So locations, uh, we deployed mason bees and nesting shelters across locations in Ohio. 10 in agriculture, 10 in urban areas, and 10 natural areas. So once we installed it, we pinned it with uh, longitude, latitude, so we can actually see. So when we Google Maps, we're able to enlarge it and see some of the, um, the floral resources that are around them and trees so we could tell you know, how well they did. We staggered the releases two weeks apart, so we released... I believe 60 um, mason bees, like let's say March, um, April 1st, um, and it varied all across Ohio. When we were in full bloom and I was working at the orchard uh, the third week of March, it was still snowing out in Cleveland. So it was very interesting. You know, they released the bees much later. Um, so we, uh, two weeks later, meanwhile, we visit the nest boxes. We pulled, uh, six reeds, filled reeds from each nest box um, for each. So the first release, and then we pulled another six from the second release. And then they were put in the freezer. Unfortunately, that killed the egg or the larvae because we didn't want them to consume the pollen provisions. So we collected them to different periods, as you can see here. And then we sent uh, these reads to the Center of Pollinator Research at Penn State, at uh, Penn State Honey and Pollen Diagnostic Lab. Here is Dr. Michelle Mansfield at uh, Christina Gorzinger Lab. Um, the DNA um, meta barcoding of pollen provides the genus level information on foraging plant plant preferences of Osmia lignaria. So I'd like to say that we were actually representing. Our client was the bee, actually. So the mason bees were our client. We were there to see what they preferred. Um, so we took the seed mix. Um, so the springtime seed mix will benefit orchards, growers, even backyard gardeners to create you know, floral strips and hedgerows to provide additional floral resources beyond the orchard bloom. And that's the trick, because if you don't have that extra floral resources, the mason bees will not continue to propagate because there'll be no um, food for them to forage on. So with Dr. Mansfield, uh, they opened all the reeds. Um, and with this, we found that um, that last we did this last spring in 2023. Um, we recovered only 77 nests from 19 different locations. So some of the locations, we didn't have any success. So out of the 30, we... Um, had were successful at uh, 19 different locations. The first and last pollen provision was collected from each nest when it was available. In total, we um, we tested 130 
samples of these individual broad provisions um, were processed by uh, Dr. Mansfield. And um, she spun the pollen, which provided down to the genus of each flower that was represented in that pollen provision, which was very cool. And next, it went to, you know, what we found was varied widely by location. Now, Dr. Lee, Dr. Michelle Lee, uh, is also a researcher at the Gorzinger Lab. This is her, that was the first time she did this to make her pie charts. So we had a location um, for, for each one. Like I said, we, we knew exactly where they were. Um, like on the top right, you see that sampling site number 23 and what they found in 23. Um, which was black locusts, 80% of that. These are orchard bees, so they tend to go to, you know, tree, flowering trees. Um, that's what, you know, blooms first in early season. And you can see the, the different other um, uh, flowers that were represented in the percentage in that particular area. Um, we had site 10 and site 25. Um, now that I look at this, I probably should have put where those sites were without looking at the full chart, but uh, Dr. Michelle Lee was able to create this for us, which was incredible. It was it actually, I looked at it and go, this is so beautiful, these charts. It was great. Um, she was great. And Dr. Michelle um, Mansfield, they were all fantastic in, in working with us. And here's uh, a result at the Cincinnati Zoo. I, uh, I, volunteer at the Cincinnati Zoo. I'm also on their horticulture committee. Um, they created, uh, as you can see, it's in the middle city. So this would have been an urban location um, on this particular, here, let me move you up here, in this particular um, area. And it really is the crown jewel of Cincinnati. It's uh, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. We Everybody jokes that it really should be called the Cincinnati Botanical Garden and zoo. They just have this extraordinary, um, beautiful 79 acres in the middle of the city. It's quite extraordinary. And here are some in the middle of the city, what they collected, nightshade, buckwheat, willow, maple, again, some of the trees, carrot and clover came in. Um, so this is very exciting. Um, just a quick note, um, Dr. Olivia Carroll was here, I believe in 2018. Um, in 20 minutes, they let her um, net some bees. In 20 minutes, she found over 30 species of native bees at the zoo in the middle of the city. They do, they are very conscious about what they plant um, to support butterflies, wasps, and, and bees. So they do a fantastic job there at the zoo. So you can see what results we had there. So you can see some of the, um, some of the, plants and trees that were represented in our in our study that came from Penn State. Again, this is Dr. Michelle Lee who created all of this. It's very, it's, she just did a beautiful job. It's easy to understand and, um, you know, see what the bees were collecting. Here, through this research, we developed three different pro proprietary seed mixes chosen by the bees. I keep saying that for you know, farmers, orchards, backyard gardeners, and um, our enclosure propagation. I've been, um, I've already had a solar company reach out to me um, here in Cincinnati, and they're very interested in our all season seed mix um, to plant. So we're in talks about that right now. So that's kind of exciting. Um, so the three different seed mix will have an all season seed mix from early spring into fall that will support not only bees, but butterflies and other important pollinators for the whole season. We'll pare that down even further for our floral strips for the growers. And then we'll pare that down even more for our uh, seed mix for our um, enclosure propagation um, for the bees, because they really don't need 32 different. They'll probably need anywhere from eight to 12 inside um, our enclosures. And once we figure out which they prefer the most, then we will um, probably pare it down even further. So it might take two or three seasons to figure that out, but hopefully it won't. 
Um, so our all season seed mix has 32 annuals and perennials backed by the research and backed by the bees. So it's, it'll be available for the public for pre-order here in the next week or so. So you can visit our website. Um, all our seed is being packaged by Ohio Prairie Seed Nursery. The seed is um, packaged in small batches and sealed and guaranteed for three years. So they're doing a fantastic job um, for us and they're just a great company. I encourage people to visit their website at opn.com. They have other, they have grasses and other seed mixes, some that just specialize in butterflies and they're fantastic to work with. We're very excited to be collaborating with them. So here are some examples. Uh, my friend Doy, uh, Roy Diblick, he is a horticulturist. He actually had his own nursery for years and years. Uh, he designs urban landscapes. This is downtown Chicago. You can see how gorgeous this is. The R seed mix would be appropriate for this kind of um, location. And um, we'll be talking to Roy about our seed mix soon here. And here was what I talking about, um, you know, floral strips and hedgerows in this orchard to offer uh, additional floral resources for the bees after bloom, after fruit, fruit and nut bloom. And here is our uh, propagation enclosure um, that this is, I believe, at uh, Logan, Utah where they, this happens to be Facilia. Facilia happens to be a wonderful flower that provides a lot of nectar and, um, and pollen for the bees. And they do very, very well here. Um, unfortunately, we do have a, a Facilia native here to the Midwest, but no one has the seed. So the Cincinnati Zoo Horticulture, we do, they do a lot of plant trials. Um, Brian Jorg, who is in the horticulture team at the Cincinnati Zoo, um, applied for a license uh, in a wild park area where he collected Facilia seed. And I just purchased about 12 of those plants. We'll have to collect that seed, share it with OPN, and see if we can establish a, um, uh, a Facilia that's native to this area. So we're very excited about that. It may take a few seasons, but not one seed company carries it. It blooms early, the bees love it, they thrive on it. It'd be great for all pollinators. Even, you know, bumblebees emerge early also in, in early spring and, you know, the honeybees are out. So this is a great, um, you know, flower to have. And there it is a closer image of the facilia. So what can you do? I get questions all the time. What can you do to help your pollinators in your backyard? And what I say is plant, plant, plant. Um, flower power is the best way you can help all your pollinators. Um, even if, it, if you're container um, planting, that's better than nothing. Creating corridors throughout your neighborhood, talking to your neighbors about planting uh, flowers. I always say plant what you love. Um, I just was asked the other day, you know, native looks kind of weedy. I'm afraid to use just native in my garden. And I said, well, if you have time, um, consult a, a uh, designer because uh, a good design can make all the difference in how your plants are installed and where to install them in your yard. It's really worth, um, if you can do it, to start there, you know, support your local nurseries go to them they have you have great staff they're really aware more today than they were in 2010 when i started doing this about pollinator friendly plants so it's a great way to start so if you have any questions about our our seed mix um you can hit the qr code it will take you to our landing page and tell you a little more about our seed mix and what's in it and how to plant it we'll have full instructions and I'd like, again, to thank our collaborators um, for without them, this would not be possible. And we're very excited for the next stage of um, putting up a enclosure this year, planting and releasing mason bees next year. And hopefully in a couple seasons, we can create a sustainable bee bank for our growers 
and working with some of the universities, restore some of the natural areas that these bees have been wild trapped in and, um, you know, hopefully build up those populations again. So it's very exciting. Thank you for having me. Well, you've been like a real joy to connect with and benefit from the show too. And just like the, I appreciate all the, just leveraging those of what you've been able to do with the, not just Sarah, but in so many other ways. And thanks for your work with the bees and the flowers and the humans in between and just wish you well. And oh, yeah, <laughs> just thank like, you. thank you for funding, funding <laughs> this project without your funding, we wouldn't have done this. So number one, a heart felt thank you to all of you who took the time to read the grant. Your feedback was great. Um, so I'm very appreciative. And um, like Morgan said, you know, you, you work with collaborators to make your science better. And that's, that's what happened here. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't have done it without them. I've learned so much. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, want to share it with whoever wants to, you know, I'm all about sharing the information.